awesome. And they were right, of course. Money can't buy you love, nor can a diamond ring, or anything for that matter. Because real love, true love, is not something you can ever merit or earn or purchase. Real love can only be given and, in response, received. Sometimes I wonder if all of our searching and striving for the pleasures of this life, all of the reaching that we do via our consumerism, hyper-consumerism, all the time we spend in the endless pursuit of the next thing, the next buzz, the next rush, I wonder if that seemingly insatiable yearning is really just about a search for love with a capital L. And I'm thinking that <clears throat> some of you, at least, are starting to already realize that, that all of those pleasures that you sometimes unstoppably seek, you're chasing, stuff, sex, power, prestige, fun, a party, a buzz, any form of entertainment, video or otherwise, that you can get your hands on, knowledge, truth, accomplishments, a legacy, you're realizing that after a while those things just don't seem to get you there. And maybe coming to the conclusion that on their own, maybe they can't. The writer of Ecclesiastes comes to the same conclusion regarding pleasure in chapter 2 of his rant. And here's most of that chapter. <clears throat> Again, searching for meaningless, the meaning of searching for some truth, something that's real, and not finding it. He says, I said to myself, let's go for it and experiment with pleasure. Have a good time. But there was nothing to it, nothing but smoke. What do I think of the fun-filled life? Insane, inane. My verdict on the pursuit of happiness? Who needs it? With the help of a bottle of wine and all the wisdom I could muster, I tried my level best to penetrate the absurdity of life. I wanted to get a handle on anything useful we mortals might do during the years we spend on this earth. Oh, I did great things. Built houses, planted vineyards, designed gardens and parks, and planted a variety of fruit trees in them, made pools of water to irrigate, irrigate the groves of trees. I bought slaves. This is back in the day when you wouldn't blush at even saying that. I bought slaves, male and female, who had children, giving me even more slaves. And then I acquired large herds and flocks larger than any before me in Jerusalem. This guy was a player. I piled up silver and gold, loot from kings and kingdoms. I gathered a chorus of singers to entertain me with song, and most exquisite of all pleasures, voluptuous maidens for my bed. Oh, how I prospered! I left all my predecessors in Jerusalem far behind, left them behind in the dust. And what's more, I kept a clear head through it all. Everything I wanted, I took. I never said no to myself. Sounds like a mantra for Western civilization today. I gave in to every impulse, held back nothing. I sucked the marrow of pleasure out of every task, my reward to myself for a hard day's work. And then I took a good look at everything I'd done, looked at all the sweat and hard work, but when I looked, I saw nothing but smoke, smoke and spitting into the wind. There was nothing to any of it, nothing. His conclusion, <laughs> the pursuit of pleasure can't buy me love. And yet, and I've learned that again and again, it seems you just continually want and pursue and go for it. And I wonder if I, or maybe if you, had the wherewithal to really let rip how far we'd really go down that pleasure road.
And I love the rawness with which the Ecclesiastes writer describes it. Everything I wanted, I took. I never said no to myself, gave in to every impulse, held back nothing, sucked the marrow of pleasure out of every task, my reward to myself for a hard day's work. And that last quote sounds like it could have come from a rock star's biopic, you know, just before the scene where he crashes and burns in some drug-induced sex orgy frenzy. Those are words that the Ecclesiastes writer writes that I'm sure every advertiser out there wants to hear from you and me. Can't you hear them whisper? Go for it. You've worked hard. You deserve it. And there's something inside that says, yeah, I deserve it, and I want that badly. This week, it came to me that we can't, that maybe one reason we can't help go for it is because it is something that we're ultimately made for. Sex has ecstasy and unparalleled intimacy, and you are made for those things. Play and adventure, they have joy and they have freedom and a sense of fresh air and wide open space. Human beings are made to experience those feelings, those emotions, those things. Possessions bring to us a sense of security and in some, time, in some circumstances a genuinely good sense of prestige, which is what you are ultimately made for. Achievement allows for acknowledgement and honor, which again, biblically, you can argue we are meant for. You are meant for all of those things in and through the love of God. God is security. He is intimacy. He is joy, your joy, and your freedom, and brings security to life and prestige and honor and acknowledgement. God sees every part of you and esteems it greatly. And what's interesting in God being the source, the ultimate source of all these things, is that God is not all of that in opposition to the worldly, the good worldly gifts of pleasure that He's given us. The sex, the wine, the work, the money, the prestige. Often, God can be all that He is to us in and through these very things. God is before everything that is, created you with capacities for pleasure and joy in whatever area you're thinking about. He made you that way. God is after all of those pleasurable experiences, the one through whom we are made and meant to say, thank you, God, for this. Again and again, thank you, God, for your abundant grace, the gifts you've given me. And God is above all these things, even as they're playing out in living and experience pleasure. And if we were to get into the right frame of mind and place, He is one through whom we can know through the pleasure. These pleasures can be touchstones or foretastes of His love and His goodness. All of God's good and pleasurable gifts can only do what they are ultimately meant to do when they are experienced in the presence and context of our eternal Creator. You think pleasure is good now. Do pleasure that way, and you will understand why God made pleasure, with, made you with that feeling, that ability to do that sense of God made pleasure and pleasures to draw you to Him. 
And when you understand pleasurable experiences and pursuits in that bigger context beyond the phenomenal world that we're living with an eternal eye and ear, then you are, I think, in the best place to find balance about how to engage in the pleasure and and focus on how to do it in a God-honoring way. When you know you're doing it before the face of God, which, whether you want to acknowledge that or not, you're doing your pleasure before. That's where the writer of Ecclesiastes ends up. We read this a couple weeks ago in the beginning of this series, but at the end of his diatribe on the meaninglessness of life, he says, this is the only answer I can come up with. He says, the last and final word is this, fear God. And we talked about what fear God means. Have faith. Live as though you're believing, actually believing that God is here, looking on your life, involved in this world that he's made, that he sees, that he hears. Fear God, do what he tells you, and that's it. Eventually, God will bring everything that we do out into the open and judge it according to its hidden intent, whether it's good or evil. So, what is the hidden intent that is driving your pursuit of pleasure and your experience of pleasure? Try to imagine, if you can, living out your your ultimate pleasure your ultimate pleasurable pursuit in this eternal before the face of God context. It's a Latin phrase, coram Deo, which I write in all those books that people ask me to sign just to remind me that I'm doing this before the face of God. We all are. Imagine doing pleasure perfectly before God. Thank you, God, for making him or her my lover, for letting me know you through the gift of this, the ecstasy and the glory, the beauty and the rest, fully alive, fully human, fully what you made me to be. Thank you, God, for making my mind the way you made it. I feel such a deep sense of meaning as I do that athletic event and am able to coordinate myself in just a sport-aware way. I feel alive engaging that huge challenge at work or at school or creating that amazing piece of art, building that course, taking apart that machine, coming up with that idea, the pleasure of all of that before the God who gifted you with it. All that is right here, God, points to all that is right that is you. And you, God, make everything right in its own time. And nothing makes sense. And you won't find peace And it won't get you there apart from understanding that you do it all coram Deo before him. A Catholic theologian and commentator sums it up best. His name's Peter Kreeft. And he says this about the book of Ecclesiastes. The point is, his final conclusion is this. Without God, no, not just without God, for the writer of Ecclesiastes speaks frequently of God without faith in God. No, not even that, for the author has faith in God. In fact, an unquestioning faith, never does he doubt God's existence. Rather, without the kind of faith in God that is larger than life and therefore worth dying for and therefore worth living for, Without a lived love affair with God, life is vanity of vanities, the shadow of a shadow, the dream within a dream. 